Welcome to Midweek Talks, where we help you follow Jesus and answer your questions in the middle of personal, social, political, and cultural issues. I'm your host, Mark Ivey. We want to welcome you today because we're going to have a great discussion, a very informative discussion with Seth Gruber, and he's our guest today. Seth, thank you for being with us at Midweek Talks. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So I'm going to have you kind of introduce yourself for a second. Uh, You're from California. I'm just going to say you're a voice of reason uh, in a lot of different areas, uh, primarily a voice for life. Just give us a little bit of your background, uh, and then uh, I want to talk to you about some real relevant issues that are happening. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you so much, Mark. it's It's so fun to be with pastors and to sit down with leaders across the country, leaders in their community and their states who are really standing, um, who, who have recognized, and you for a while it seems like, some pastors more recently, but have recognized that keeping their liturgy in the church is no longer acceptable. Mm-hmm. To merely keep your worship and your Christianity compartmentalized is no longer acceptable. We're called to be stewards of what God has given us. And in America, we are the most powerful political entity in human history Mm. because we, the people, are the sovereign. So we have significantly greater responsibility for how this country turns out. And that's specifically true as it relates to the issue of abortion. Um, And so it's so so great to be with you guys. I had a great time with you guys on Sunday, hanging out with your people and and getting to have lunch with some of them. So thank you so much for your courage and for how you're standing and, and, and leading the broad towards abolishing this great evil. So those of you who are watching today, I want you to share this because you're going to hear some information that maybe you have never heard before, and we're just going to talk to you about the truth. And so, Seth, I want to ask you some questions because there are some things happening in the nation right now that go way back um, 30, 40, 50 years, even longer than that in our history. I was at a love life prayer gathering at the Latrobe abortion clinic in Charlotte, which is the largest abortion clinic in the Southeast. They've uh, murdered over 100,000 babies um, since uh, 2001. And I was, uh, and by the way, it is a prayer meeting for those of you that uh, are wondering what love life does. It's uh, basically a prayer meeting Uh, around these abortion centers in America. And so I stood back for a moment that day. And of course we're there with the issue of abortion, but then I noticed the LGBTQ community was there. I recognized Black Lives Matter's support there. I also recognized that much of the local law enforcement, which we support, was also sort of anti what we were doing and in support of everybody else that was there. And I stood back and I said, wait a minute. This is no longer a singular issue with just abortion. All of these organizations have joined themselves together. So we didn't get to where we are today with 63 million babies killed in the womb. We didn't get where we're at today simply with a Supreme Court decision in 1973. Something led up to that. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let's see why we're here today and what's taken place over the last 50, 60 years. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Yeah, thank you for, for your courage and for being a pastor who stands outside of these death camps. So what a lot of people don't understand about the abortion wars, about the abortion industry in this battle between the pro-life movement and those who support abortion, is it's not just a political battle. It's not just a cultural battle. It's not just a battle between your two different alternative political parties that you can pick between. For the left and the abortion rights movement, abortion is a sacrament. Abortion so explain the, what that term is. That's right. So abortion is the greatest sacrament of the religion of secular progressivism. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in just one second. But your experience outside of the abortion clinic is indicative and a pointer to the spiritual realm and the spiritual reality that we're fighting against. So you got BLM, you got LGBTQ people, you have abortion rights people. Different movements sometimes, different focuses, but with abortion they all unite. And they all unite because they all hold to the same religion. So 
leftism is not an alternative politics. It's an alternative religion. Mm -hmm. A sacrament is for the Christian, something we participate in to remind ourselves um, whom we serve. Such as communion. That's right, or baptism, right? Yeah. Whom we serve and, um, and, and a reminder of our salvation. So when we break bread and we drink the wine, right, we're reminding ourselves about who saves us and who we serve. Christ himself, who entered human history in a womb <laughs> in order to re redeem mankind from their sins. So the left holds to a religion. It's called secular humanism or secular right. liberalism, right. secular progressivism. And they have religious beliefs. They have religious tenets. Um, they just masquerade their religion as politics. And this is because eternity is written on the heart of man. So every individual is a religious individual. We look for religious answers to religious questions, like why are we here? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Is there an afterlife? Can I live forever? Can I find peace and a solution to my tormented soul? These are the type of questions we ask as human beings, um, and we find different answers to them. And each religion provides a different answer to those questions. So secular progressivism has answers to those questions as well. They just approach that debate and question from a very different perspective. So the, the sort of religious belief of this religion, the culture of death, secular progressivism, is called body self-dualism. It's probably one of the most religious beliefs that they hold to. It's very confusing, but if you grasp this, for those of you watching, I think your eyes will be opened up to the entire religion of the left. So body self-dualism or Gnostic dualism says that the real you, Mark, is not your body. And by the way, Gnostic dualism has been declared a heresy by the church. Right. So wake up, it's a spiritual battle. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this idea of body self-dualism is actually not new. It's actually very ancient. It even goes back to people like Plato who believe this. So body self-dualism says the real Mark, the real Mark Ivy is not your body. So when I shake your hand, I'm actually not shaking Mark Ivey's hand because you see the real Mark is his thoughts, his aims, his desires, his consciousness, his self-awareness, his cognitive abilities, his ability to interact with his environment. So in other words, your soul, <laughs> right? Mm. The, that's the real you. Now, Christ shows that, the, that we are both body and soul. The theological term for this is hylomorphism. We are ensouled human beings. And C.S. Lewis talked about this too, right? We're not just uh, a body with a soul. We are both body and soul. And Christ proves this, by the way, by, by allowing himself to be killed and then rising bodily. Hmm. He wasn't just a spirit floating around. Christ rose bodily. And they with, actually questioned. Jesus said, I'm not just a spirit. Touch me. That's feel right. Me. Touch me. Yeah. Yes. Here are the holes in my hands. Yes. Right? And so, um, so Christ proves the importance of us being ensouled human beings, both body and soul. And, and from a sort of common sense perspective, Mark, this really should make a lot of sense, this fact that we're both body and soul. For example, if that's not true and the real Mark is just your soul and not your body, then it means that um, you've never hugged your mother, Mark, because you can't hug consciousness and desires. Right. It also means that men have never actually raped women. They've only raped their bodies because the real them is not their mm. body. I mean, it, it leads to very heinous, strange conclusions that the left would probably not like to adopt, right? The left was the, uh, behind Me Too, right? The Me Too movement right, yes. of women saying, come on, bring, uh, uh, you know, name the accusers. And by the way, amen. Like if, you're, if you've been right. sexually abusing women, like you should go behind the bars forever. Um, but they, they don't have the theological basis, Mark, to explain why sexual abuse is wrong because their religious belief is that the real us is not our body. So our bodies, according to the religion of secular progressivism, Mark, is just a shell for the real us. And by saying that, though, it removes us from personal responsibility for our actions. Yep, that's right, exactly. So I, the, the reason I said all that is because you have to understand the, the spiritual and religious tenets and beliefs of the culture of death. The culture of death is, are the priests of secular progressivism. Secular progressivism believes that there's a difference between you, the person, and you, your body. And this is also what animates their support for transgenderism. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. If you were born with male genitalia, and that's part of your body, but you feel like you're a little girl inside, then the real right. you 
is your thoughts, your consciousness, your desires, your aims, your self-awareness. And if that inside you is telling you that you're actually a little girl, then it doesn't matter that you have male genitalia because the body's nothing. The body is not the real you. So this religious belief, you guys, actually informs everything that they believe and all the, and all the ways that they trickle down those beliefs through political activism. It also animates their support of abortion, right? So what happens, Mark, when being human is not enough to grant your rights? Because we know the unborn child is a human being with a human body. We know that. Mm -hmm. So they can look at the unborn child in the womb and say, it is a human being. It has a human body, but it doesn't have rights because of their belief in body self-dualism. That the real person is not the baby's body. It's the baby's thoughts, consciousness, desires, and self-awareness. Now, do unborn children, are they self-aware? Do they have desires yet? Are they conscious yet in the womb? No. Right? The unborn child does not have a desire to go on living, but it is in virtue of being an unborn human being to have desires. They just haven't realized it yet. But if we accept that premise that the unborn may be a human, but they're not a person because they don't have desires or consciousness or ability to feel pain or whatever, the problem with that is that those functions will also be found lacking in many born people as well. So if you use that, that litmus test for the unborn child's right to life, you can also use that litmus test to deny a right to life to people already born. People who have suicidal tendencies don't have a desire to go on living. Buddhists who achieve nirvana, which right. I don't think is possible by the way, but if you achieve right. nirvana, you've eradicated all desires. So like mm -hmm. the child in the womb, you don't have a desire to go on living. So if I kill the, those people, have I not violated their rights? No, of course I violated their rights. The unborn may not be self-aware. Guess what? Most recent scientific evidence points to the fact, Mark, that infants are not self-aware until months after birth, meaning they're not right. self-aware of themselves yes. as an individual unique entity. So that's the problem with the religion of secular progressivism is by separating the term human from person, the human body from the real you, they then have to come up with functions, criteria, cognitive abilities that ground your rights. Because remember, having a human body and being a human being is not enough to ground and, your and rights. And so then they I, have to come up with a checklist okay. of, of functions. And until you meet those functions and cognitive abilities, you're not a person with a right to life. And this is the reason why euthanasia can be permitted because somebody who is exactly. not well, maybe has dementia, they're 82 years old, well, we can take their life because it's okay. That's exactly right. Right. Yep. And so the left and the abortion rights movement, for the most part, Mark, also supports doctor-assisted suicide. Right. Why? Yeah. Because maybe, like the child in the womb, that elderly citizen, or frankly, any age citizen, yes. doesn't have a desire to go on living. Just like the child doesn't have a desire in the womb to go on living. Or they also support euthanasia. So now we've moved beyond doctor-assisted suicide. Yeah. We're talking about you, you're murdering people without their consent because they're old and they're a burden on society. And maybe like the child in the womb, they're unwanted by their family members. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why most people sure. resort to euthanasia. Literally, children, adult children, will arrange the murder of their parents and euthanize them mm -hmm. because they're too expensive to care for, they're a burden on the family or society, and they're unwanted. Oh, look at that, Mark. The same justifications people use to kill the unborn. <laughs> Too right. expensive, a burden on the family, and unwanted. So this is why I say ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. But we are not fighting an alternative politics, guys. We're fighting an alternative religion. So when pastors say, uh, Seth, we don't, we don't speak on politics. We're not a political church, Mark. You know, we yeah. just preach the gospel. Right. Um, firstly, I don't even know what that means. But firstly, I say, well, can you preach against false religion? If you can't mm. preach against politics, can you preach against false religion? I think the Bible would have you do that. Yes. And, and leftism or secular progressivism is an alternative religion. Okay, so they have these strange religious beliefs, like Gnostic dualism. Mm -hmm. They're not political beliefs. They're not, oh, just my personal cultural beliefs. No, that's a religious belief. To say that yeah. the real you is not your body, that's a religious belief. And it's been deemed a heresy by the church. Um, but they also have a sacrament. And the greatest sacrament of the religion of secular progressivism is abortion. So here's what I mean by this, okay? We participate in sacraments to remind ourselves what we love and whom we serve, whom we love and whom we serve. So we break the bread and we drink the wine to remind ourselves that we love and are devoted to Christ, and we serve him as a creator of the universe who broke his body, rose again, so we could rise again too. 
Well, the culture of death participates in the sacrament of abortion to remind themselves whom they love and whom they serve, namely themselves. So abortion is not just murder and child sacrifice, it's also idolatry. Because abortion is ultimately your pursuit to deify yourself into modern gods. Because a god, Mark, gets to decide who lives and who dies, mm -hmm. right? But a god is also entitled to eternal life. By definition, a god lives forever. But we understand that there's only one god. Yahweh means one god. So any other small g god is not actually another deity. It's actually just Satan masquerading as a little bronze statue. So this all goes back to the very first lie in the garden from the serpent in the tree to Eve and Adam, right? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your you eyes shall, shall be yes. opened and ye shall be as gods. Ye shall be as gods. The lie that has fascinated the pagan cultures, pagan societies, and the religion of secular progressivism for thousands of years, that they could achieve the status of a god, that they could live forever. So they, Mark, pursue the same thing that Christians do, eternal life, but through a very different avenue, a very different lane. What does 1 Corinthians tell us? 15, I believe. The last enemy to be defeated right. is death. The left, you guys, also believes that the last enemy to be defeated is death. But they stole that from the Christian worldview. They don't understand that death has already been defeated. Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, defeats death and says, you can defeat death too. Trust in me and my blood shed for you and you will live forever with me in glory. Well, the left also pursues eternal life, Mark. And they sacrifice children as a substitute for eternal life. So pagan cultures and societies have always done this, by the way. Whether and it's it was, always with the shedding of blood. That's right. Whether it was the Canaanites, and by the way, right. the Israelites doing it with the Canaanites, yes. sacrificing babies to Moloch, or the Aztecs, uh, the Irish did this as well. Uh, many pagan societies and cultures have participated in human sacrifice. Infants, children, and adults, human sacrifice. Yeah to the war gods, the sex yes. gods, the crop gods, the weather gods. And so what, is, what was the motivation behind human sacrifice, Mark? The belief was that in exchange for the human being that you murdered and sacrificed to a little bronze statue, which was really just Satan, mm -hmm. you were going to receive a blessing in return. Right. Better crops, better weather, better health, right? More children that you didn't kill. In other words, human sacrifice becomes a substitute for eternal life to improve or extend your own life. So with abortion, we kill babies in order to steal their stem cells in order to try to cure diseases and extend our own lives. Mm -hmm. We kill babies to use their parts to perform experiments and test biological drugs and vaccines in order to cure diseases and extend our own lives. Scientists very recently in the last two months, Mark, have just announced that they're pushing to drop the 14-day limit it's kind of an unspoken rule. It's not in, in our laws. This unspoken 14-day limit on how long you're allowed to grow human beings artificially outside the womb. So this is, this is what right, happens yeah. in in vitro fertilization. Yeah. You create a baby in a Petri dish, you know, sperm and egg, yeah, yeah. conception. That's an eternal soul at that point. Yes. That's a human being that's never existed before and will never exist again that God is knitting together. But you conceive them in a Petri dish. You intentionally deny them their mother's womb and a mother and a father. And then you see how long you can develop them, Mark. How long can we grow this baby, this eternal soul, in Petri dishes? What they're trying to do right now, Mark, this just came out within the last month, they're trying to drop the 14-day limit to see how much longer they can grow babies past 14 weeks. Why? They want to tinker around with gene modification. Right. To tinker and screw around and, 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 and edit their genes. Because if you're going to do something as, as gnarly as gene editing, oh, we got to test it on the babies first, Mark. Well, we don't want to be our own lab rats, so we'll just test it on the babies who we don't believe are persons because we are secular progressives who believe in Gnostic dualism, so the real body's not them, so we're not actually harming a person. It's totally fine. So we'll sacrifice children in order to test gene editing. Why? So we can perfect ourselves. So we can edit our genes and get rid of diseases. And why would we do that, Mark? To live forever. Because the serpent is still in the ear of the pagan culture saying, ye shall live forever. You can be as gods. And so abortion is just a replacement for eternal life. And Peter Kraft put this perfectly. Peter Kraft, Catholic philosopher, said, abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. This is my body. 
but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. So Christ on the cross says, this is my body broken for you, take and eat in remembrance of me for eternal life. But the culture of death, Mark says the same words. This is my body and I'll kill whatever's inside of it in order to deify myself into a modern God because a God gets to decide who lives and who dies. So Christ says, I break my body and shed my blood for you for eternal life. And the culture of death demands that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. But it's still demon worship and it's still Satan behind the killing of babies. So that's why abortion is the greatest sacrament of the religion of secular so progressivism. every one of these individuals essentially is a pagan priest. Yep. They're the high priests of secular liberation. They're the high priest and they're functioning just like they did in the Old Testament with the sacrifices with Moloch and other gods. They became, we now have modern day priests that are still doing the same thing. It hasn't changed because even Paul said, you're sacrificing to demons. It's That's the right. same thing then. He did. It's yep. the same thing now. And God said that in the Old Testament too, that you sacrifice your sons and daughters to demons. Mm. Um, and so what we need to understand and wake up to as Christians and the, and the bride of Christ, Mark, is that Satan has always been behind the killing of babies. He's the dragon in Revelation waiting for Mary to give yes. birth to Christ. Yes. To what? To eat him. He's behind mm. the killing of babies by Herod in Bethlehem and by Pharaoh in Egypt. He's always been behind the killing of babies. But here's the thing. Satan doesn't care the name of the God that you sacrifice your children to. So Moloch was actually Satan. Was Satan happy to go by the name of Moloch? Sure, he was happy to go by that name. Right. So today, Mark, he's happy to go or by the name. Or Chemosh or Baal or, or exactly. whatever. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. right. And today he's happy to go by the names of money, selfishness, education, and career well-being. As long as you continue to shove children down his throat, he'll be satisfied. So my godfather and one of the godfathers of the pro-life movement, Greg Cunningham, once said that Satan would kill God if he could, but he can't. So he kills babies because he knows it wounds the heart of God and hurts the church. This is the spiritual warfare happening. So secular progressivism, which is the religion of the Democratic Party, by the way, Mark, right. they masquerade Oh, that's politics, brother. Exactly. Okay. They are high priests of the religion of secular progressivism, which is ultimately just demonology. It's, almost, yeah. it's ultimately just service of, and, and worship of Satan. But they masquerade as politics and politicians. Why? Because they know that churches in America fear the word politics. They know how many pastors are afraid of, of getting political and speaking to political issues. And so they say, hey, hey uh, Mark, hey, you're just a Christian, right? You, you just preach the gospel. You can, in your pulpit. Just keep that liturgy in the church, but don't talk about politics because you're not called to be political. Well, ultimately, we're not fighting an alternative politics. We're fighting a rival religion. So when they talk about becoming gods, and essentially that's what they're after, this is why what we're seeing in the culture right now with a current political atmosphere that tells everybody what they have to do. You have to shut down your churches. You have to take a vaccine. You have to put on a mask. You have to do this. To them, it's not a political decision. This is where people are missing it. This is really a spiritual decision of becoming a God and telling everybody else what to do because they're God and we're not. That's right. And it's also a liturgy, right? So liturgy yeah. originally meant public work. I did research on this yeah. recently. Yeah. It meant public work, meaning the people of God participating in the work of God for the glory of God. It, it meant public engagement. It didn't just mean corporate singing of hymns and reading right, of yes, psalms. Yes. It meant build the city, build the yes, wall, yes. build the kingdom of God. That's the yes. liturgy. A liturgy is supposed to be you working out your faith in the public square, in every sphere, a comprehensive yeah. Christianity. So today, the left has a far more ro robust view of liturgy than Christians do. Mm -hmm. They work out their secular progressive religion through public engagement. So for the left, Mark, politics is liturgy. Politics mm -hmm. is liturgy because it's how they enshrine and promote their religious views in the public square. Right. But it's an alternative religion and it's a false religion. And if we can't preach against false religion as Christians, what can we preach against? So let's go back to the 1960s. And let's talk about this entanglement of, first of all, the rise of what we have referred to as a sexual revolution, which is really a religion. That's right. And the rise of that that moves into a cultural feeling that it's okay in 1973 
to say, you know what, I think that we can go ahead and legalize uh, murder across the country. So how did we get to 1973? And then how did we get to where we are now? Because it began way before that. Yeah, very good question. So a lot of people, particularly Christians, unfortunately, don't understand the history of the abortion rights movement and the sexual and the sexual rights movement, the sexual revolution. And these two things became very much entwined with the women's rights movement. Okay. So originally the women's rights movement and the National Organization for Women, founded by Betty Friedan, who was one of the most popular feminists of that era, originally did not support abortion. So Betty Friedan originally, her goal was to raise up women, what we would call today first wave feminists. And first wave feminism is right. pretty uncontroversial. It's just like right. full equality before the law. Yeah. It's when you get to second and third wave feminism that you end up having like reverse sexism, like men are patriarchal right, right. animals and we need to, you know, women need to have certain rights that men don't have, including the right to kill their own children. <laughs> mm. So first wave feminism, totally fine, and full equality before the law. So that's what they were, they, they were seeking after. And the early suffragettes and the early feminists who were, who were working in the political system for full equality before the law were pretty much all pro-life. The early suffragettes and feminists, all pro-life. Because they understood that true feminism can't be pro-abortion. Because true feminism ends up rejecting the most fundamental aspects of the female and what makes her unique, which is her ability right. to, to conceive a new eternal human being, gestate and develop that human being, and then go through birth. I mean, we should be calling this a superpower. <laughs> right? We yeah, should yeah, be praising yeah. women's ability to mm -hmm. do this. And as Christians, all the more so because we understand that that's God's intention. God doesn't make mistakes. It's not a mistake you have a uterus and you're able to, yeah. to create new life. And that's, that men don't. That's right. That's God's idea. And yeah. it's a beautiful thing. And we yeah. should recognize that it comes from him. Um, so early feminists understood that abortion was actually the complete antithesis of feminism <laughs> because yeah. it, it told women in order to achieve full equality with men, which was their initial goal, right, Mark? right? That actually also needs to now entail the legal ability to pay a physician to violate the sacred space of your womb and to murder, vacuum out, or dismember limb from limb a human being that only women can create. So early feminists rejected abortion because of the antithetical nature that it posed to femininity, which is this is what makes us unique and beautiful. Right. And abortion was the ultimate rejection of that. Okay, so Larry Later, this complete pervert and, and sex-obsessed individual in the 60s, wanted to legalize abortion. And he teamed up with guys like Bernard Nathanson. Now, Bernard Nathanson was an abortionist in New York. And he was performing abortions there in the late 60s and early 70s. Illegally at that Well, point. it was legal in New York. Yeah, okay. Right, but it was illegal at the federal level. Right. And in other states, it was illegal. But in New right. York, New York's always been one of the most dangerous states for unborn children. Yeah, okay? that's true. And so Bernard Nathanson oversaw over 75,000 abortions, Mark performed over 5,000 himself, including one on his own pre-born daughter. He aborted his own daughter, performed an abortion on his wife, later had a conversion to Christ and the pro-life mm -hmm. movement, and went on to say that fewer women would have abortions if wombs had windows. And mm -hmm. he spent the rest of his life trying to end abortion. He produced the film called The Silent Scream, Right. The first yeah. film that showed a baby trying to get away from the forceps in the vacuum tube mm. and forever mourned and tried to do penance for the absolute horror that he had wrought on unborn children. Okay, well, before his conversion, when he was working with Larry Later to try to legalize abortion at the federal level, he started creating figures and lies about the number of women who were dying from back alley. Right illegal abortions. And the reason why they ginned up these large numbers, Mark, was because they wanted to create fear within the culture and country for the continuation of illegal abortion. So in other words, if they could say that tens of thousands of women were dying from dangerous back alley illegal abortions, then that would position them, Mark, to make this case we need to legalize abortion to protect women. Right. Because look at the bloodshed. Look at these tens of thousands of women who are hemorrhaging 
right? They're having their uterine lining sliced open accidentally, right. and they're dying from coat hanger, back alley, dangerous Which abortions. was a lie. Exactly. But Mark, if you care for women, come on. If you care for women, we need to legalize abortion to protect the women so they're not dying unnecessarily. That became the lie. Well, he wrote a book later after his conversion called Aborting America, published in 1997, uh, 1979. Here's what he said in his book. He said, I confess that I knew the figures were a total lie, but they were useful for our political goals. He says that he knew in reality the number of illegal back alley abortions that were happening every year prior to 1973 were only maybe 80, 90, 100 or so. Hmm. But they threw, out, they threw out the numbers tens of thousands. And he said, I confess, I knew the numbers were a total lie. Which, which in my head right now tells me all the numbers we're hearing about anything that's in right. a progressive religion cannot be believed. That's right. Because anything is justified right. in the pursuit of a religious objective truth. Right. And if that religious objective truth for the secular progressive is that ye shall be as gods, and we need to remake society in our own image, because there is no real God, the only God is us, well, then a God gets to decide who lives and who dies. And if a right, God yes. gets to decide who lives and who dies, yeah. Mark, a God certainly can lie to achieve his religious utopian goals. Yeah. So exactly, exactly, because for the left, politics is liturgy. And so any type of lie is justified in order to pursue the divine, which is yourself. <laughs> yeah. So he admitted that he lied about those numbers, but Bernard Nathanson was working with this pervert, Larry Later, to help legalize abortion at the federal level. And they ended up being successful and they found Norma McCorvey, um, a young woman who had been abandoned, right. who didn't have support, who I believe was a drug addict, um, who was pregnant in Texas. And they used two young women lawyers to use Norma McCorvey as their plaintiff in order to argue that she needed an abortion because she had been raped, even though she hadn't been, mm -hmm. in order to, to argue that we need to legalize abortion at the federal level. And they were successful. And then they abandoned Norma McCorvey and used her as just a tool for their right. political agenda. And so Larry Later was responsible along with legalizing abortion with Bernard Nathanson and other activists, one of the ways that he did that was he convinced Betty Friedan of the National Organization for Women to include abortion rights within their platform. Because prior to that, the feminist movement and the voting rights movement and National Organization for Women, their goal was not abortion. That was not their focus. And Betty Friedan wrote early on that, that she didn't support that. Well, he, he talked her into including abortion rights within, within the feminist movement and their platform. And so the two became one. So the women's rights movement became one with the abortion rights and sexual rights movement. And that's ultimately what propelled the abortion rights movement to success. In fact, Larry later said, um, the, again, he's, he's probably the, the most important figure in the legalization of abortion that nobody knows of, very few people mm -hmm. know of. Larry later admitted that, that he didn't think they'd be able to legalize abortion if they didn't get the feminists and the women's rights movement on board. So when those two things became one, that really spelled the death um, for the pro-life movement and for the protection of the unborn. So in terms of morality and the American morality, what part did Alfred Kinsey and then Hugh Hefner actually play right. in this whole lead up to 1973? Yeah, Alfred Kinsey and Hugh Hefner are, are two of the, the highest high priests of, of secular progressivism. Hugh Hefner, one of the greatest dehumanizers and commodifiers of the last hundred years. I mean, yeah. sex sells, as is popular to say, and, right. and boy, did, did uh, Hugh Hefner sell it. I, I want to just real quick have you reiterate again the piece about high priest because I want people listening to get this. This is a religion, not just a secular practice. Amen. That's right. Um, because here's the thing. If you can justify the murder of an innocent human being, Mark, what can you not justify? As Mother Teresa once said, if abortion is not wrong, nothing is. Yeah. If you can violate the womb by forcibly dilating the cervix before it's supposed to dilate because it's supposed to naturally remain shut until your child is developed enough to, mm. to come out, if you can violate that space and tear the limbs off of an innocent human being and kill that human being on the altar of yourself, what can you not do? You can justify anything if you can do that. If you can, if you can free yourself even from human nature by granting the premise of Gnostic dualism, which says that your human nature and the fact that you have a human body and you're a human being, that's not enough to have rights. If you can free yourself even from the human body and from human nature, then there's no end to your political project. And that's always been the goal of the secular progressive movement is to completely upend society 
so that they can remake it in their own image. So thank you for giving me that chance again because yes, I everyone just watching want this people needs to, to grab get this, this because this, this is, is it's a, a paradigm religion. shift. That's right. Of, of how we view politics. It's a different religion, but like Satan in Scripture, Mark, it masquerades as an angel of light. Yes. That's from the Bible. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Well, so does the religion of secular progressivism who are ultimately just the high priests of Satan. Because if there's one God and you are not a son or daughter of God and we fight with spiritual principalities, then any other quote unquote God is actually just Satan. It's actually just Satan masquerading as an alternative religion in order to pull people away from the kingdom of God. So that's what people need to understand. Okay, so Alfred Kinsey and Hugh Hefner I mean, you know, some of, some of Satan's favorite individuals in his kingdom. High priests. That's right. You, you refer to them as yes. high priests. High priests, that's yeah. exactly right. Uh, Hugh Hefner, founder of Playboy magazine, right? I mean, built on the premise that, uh, that women can be enjoyed and, and dehumanized purely for their looks, purely for their body parts. And of course, if you, if you guys have studied sort of the history of pornography and the history of Playboy and all of these things, right. big links, big links between sex trafficking, pornography, yeah. And uh, in uh, Playboy, which is ultimately right. just pornography. I mean, there's big links between all of these. And so, uh, Mary Calderon yeah. was the medical director for Planned Parenthood in the 60s. Okay, so, yeah. so here, I, I'm about to show you guys how Planned Parenthood uses the ideas of Alfred Kinsey, a sexual degenerate, in order to sell abortions. So, um, Mary Calderon was an enthusiast of Alfred Kinsey. And she was from Planned Parenthood. Who was Alfred Kinsey? Alfred Kinsey was a, a sex researcher who founded the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, and it's still there. Alfred Kinsey believed his fundamental premise, what drove all of his research, was that children are sexual from birth and have sexual rights to sexual pleasure. Okay, if you're a parent and you're watching this and you have your, your toddlers in the room or your young kids, maybe watch this at a different time. <laughs> Wait to have this conversation with them later. This is probably rated, at, rated R for the next couple minutes. So Alfred Kinsey believed that about children. Completely disgusting and sick. Well, mm. as a researcher, quote unquote, he didn't actually want to follow the research where it leads. He was already convinced. He had already convinced himself as a pervert that children were sexual from birth and had sexual right. rights to sexual pleasure. So he just used quote unquote research to prove that which he already believed was true. So he wasn't seeing, let's see where the science leads. <laughs> he yeah. was just using science to try to prove what he already believed. Uh, kind of like we've done that in the last 14 months. Yeah. Dr. Fauci, one of the highest priests of secular progressivism, using science to just justify what he already believes is true. Anyways, mm. so what he does is he writes several books on human sexuality. One was called uh, Sexuality in the Human Male. Another one was called Sexuality in the Human Female. If you buy these books, by the way, to learn about him, keep them on a high shelf away from your children. So in Table 34 of, of Sexuality in the Human Male, Mark, Alfred Kinsey documents the rape and sexual abuse of children by pedophiles that he hired over the course of 24 hours as they were forcibly induced to orgasm and had their orgasm timed with a stopwatch. We're talking mm. infants, Mark. Mm. Infants, toddlers, and young children who were raped by pedophiles. But don't worry, it was just research, it was just science. And so he used that, the, that, that research to, to then assert, see, I was right. I saw them enjoy it. I saw them enjoy sexual pleasure and orgasm. Even if they were writhing, screaming, and, right. and, and, and flipping around, it didn't matter. He said, aha, they enjoyed it. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff, Mark, where if you had walked into Indiana University at the Kinsey Institute and you saw this stuff happening, if, any, if anyone in this church had a concealed carry permit, we would have shot these guys in the head right there. Right. I mean, unbelievable. Um, and they should have gotten the death penalty, in my opinion. Okay, so that was his research, and that's what he used to prove his premise. Guess what? His research at the Kinsey Institute provided the moral and philosophical basis for what we today call comprehensive sexuality education, or sex ed, which Planned Parenthood is primarily involved with crafting. So Planned Parenthood hires sex educators all around the country, right. okay? They base their sexual education off of Alfred Kinsey. And my good friend, Monica Klein, who was a former Planned Parenthood sex educator, mm. met Christ, joined the pro-life movement, now says that she does penance. She's doing penance yeah. for what? For the damage she wrought. Um, she says that amongst Planned Parenthood sexual education circles and other sexual education individuals, she said that all of them always talked about how much they looked up to and admired Alfred Kinsey. So if that doesn't make you nauseous, I don't know what will. Okay, so... Mary Calderon 
the medical director for Planned Parenthood in the 60s, before abortion was even legal, was a Kinsey enthusiast. Right. She was a Kinsey disciple. She also believed that children were sexual from birth and had sexual rights to sexual pleasure. She accepted seed money from Hugh Hefner <laughs> to found an organization called SICUS, S-I-E-C-U-S, the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States. Guess who was behind at the, and at the helm of all of the creation of comprehensive sexuality education, both here and abroad? That organiza organization, SICUS, which was founded by Planned Parenthood with money from Hugh Hefner based on the ideas of Alfred Kinsey, which is to sexualize children while they're young because if they have sexual rights, Mark, then they also have the rights to know everything about sex. Because how do you exercise a right that you know nothing about? That's their premise. Mm -hmm. That's what they believe. So we need to sexualize children while they're young, tell them everything about sex, even the most dangerous forms, because they have a right to know about that, that so that they can exercise their natural right. Okay. Hence, legalize um, doing whatever you want to do with kids. That's right. Pedophile, make it, make it legal. That's right. Yep. And so, speaking of pedophilia and speaking of some of this disgusting stuff, Mark, there was a man by the name of Wardell Pomeroy. Wardell Pomeroy was a former director of the Kinsey Institute and the founding board member of SICUS. So the, one of the founding board members with Mary Calderon for the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States provided by Seed Money by Hugh Hefner was a former Kinsey director of the Institute. And he, he told Time Magazine in a 1980 interview, this guy Wardell Pomeroy, that um, um, incest was not necessarily bad. And he said that incest between children and adults can sometimes be beneficial, end quote. That's what he told Time Magazine in 1980 interview. These were the high priests of secular progressivism who were crafting the sexuality education to get it into America's public schools to sexualize your guys' children because they want another sexual revolution. And the way you do that is you sexualize people while they're young, innocent, and ignorant to what is happening to them because sex debases us to our most animalistic and debased appetites. It prevents rational thinking and it makes it easy to manipulate people if all they're focused on is sex. Also, having people have a lot of lot of sex creates more unwanted babies, which becomes more prospects for Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry to kill because the more unwanted babies there are, the, the richer Planned Parenthood and the abortion right. industry gets. And so these, this is the founding of comprehensive sexuality education, and it's in our public schools today. And so we have laws against obscenity, right? It's illegal to show children pornographic material. Right. Unfortunately, we, we rarely enforce our laws right. against obscenity in America. Well, guess what? our schools are under what's called an obscenity exemption. And an obscenity exemption says that you can show children the very type of material that in any other context would be illegal if it's deemed for educational value. And all of our public schools, or 44 states, have an obscenity exemption for the public schools. So that this type of garbage can get into our public schools and masquerade as just health. It's just for the health of students. But it's being written, developed, and promoted and implemented by Planned Parenthood who believes what Mary Calderon believed, who believed what Alfred Kinsey believed, who believed what Hugh Hefner believed, which is that children are sexual from birth and have sexual rights to sexual pleasure. So listen up, folks. Sexuality education is their sales funnel. Abortion is their product. And your daughters are their prospects. Just say it one more time. Comprehensive sexuality education, or sex ed, is their sales funnel. It's how they sexualize children. So abortion is their product. That's ultimately what they're selling in that funnel. And your daughters are their prospects. Because ultimately, because men can't get pregnant, it has to be the women. And, and so when the women get pregnant, they want them to come in for abortions. And so when they do the sexuality education, Mark, in these public schools, what they'll do is they'll expose children to anything and everything sexually, even the most right. darkest, dangerous forms, so that they can exercise their sexual rights. But then, now that they're telling them, hey, it's okay to do all these sexual things, kids. Just do it safely. Well, now once they say that, do you know what Planned Parenthood says in these schools? They say, well, now you need to come in and get tested once a month 
to make sure you don't have STDs. Because if you're having sex, you've got to do it safely. Part of doing it safely is make sure you don't have infections. So just come in on a regular basis for uh, birth control, for condoms, and for STD testings. Now they've built a relationship, right? Now what are they doing? They're discipling your children into the religion of secular progressivism. This is all about discipleship and evangelism, but it's to a whole different religion and it's to a whole different God. So then what happens, Mark, when they continue to act upon the desires that the high priests of secular progressivism told them that they had a natural right to, eventually they get pregnant. And so then they have a longstanding relationship with the children who have been coming in for testing and for condoms and for birth control. And now the, the, the ultimate next step is just to give them an abortion. And then if they get pregnant again, come back in again. So this is why they push comprehensive sexuality education. And we've seen, by the way, in states like Tennessee, where I just was on Mother's Day, I preached a Mother's Day sermon at Calvary Chapel, Chattanooga, to rally the troops to fight against Planned Parenthood, who just hired a sex educator in Chattanooga <laughs> to get that right. garbage into their schools. Um, we were rallying the troops there, and Pastor Frank Ramser of Calvary Chapel Chattanooga made the point that Tennessee has long had um, abstinence education, because if you really care about children not getting STDs, right. right, or not getting unwanted pregnancies or whatever, well, the, the best proven method, guess what, guess what it's called? Abstinence, because <laughs> right, if you yeah. don't have sex at all, you're not going to get diseases, you're not going to get unwanted pregnancy, and by the way, it'll be better for your soul, too, because we're created by God, and uh, we fare best when we obey his mm. rules. And so he made the point that um, abstinence education in Tennessee has actually significantly decreased the number of STDs, STIs, um, unwanted pregnancies, and abortions. Right, because you're teaching good ideas, and you're telling children that you're not purely a sexual being. You're both body and soul. Reject the, the, the religion of Gnostic dualism. You are an ensouled individual, so what you do physically actually impacts you emotionally, too. You're creating soul ties with someone when yes. you have sex with them. So the, uh, the, um, that type of education has actually done a much better job in Tennessee catering to the health of minors. The very word that Planned Parenthood uses to push comprehensive sexuality education is we're doing it because we care about kids' health. Well, no, you don't. You're actually increasing the likelihood that they'll have STIs and STDs and then that you can kill their child who becomes a prospect for abortion. And so all of this is, is like a mixing bowl all mixed together with one goal. And so talk for just a minute as we... Um, as we get ready to uh, close here, talk to us for a minute. Talk directly to Christians and churches for next steps because a lot of this is, right. you know, like, oh, it's not my deal. It's not my thing. Yeah. Um, talk to us as Christians and say, amen. here's what you need to do yeah, amen. and you need to get on it. Yeah, amen. So listen, if you guys are listening to this and you're like, that's cool, Seth. Like, that's awesome. I love that you're pro-life. That's really cool that you do that, that God's called you to that. Amen, brother. I'll be praying for you, you know, and, and maybe we'll come out to a Love Life event one time. And praise God for you, Seth. But listen, uh, abortion's not my issue, Seth. That's cool that it's your issue, Seth, but my issue is serving at the soup kitchen once a week. Uh, and, you know, my issue is um, you're fighting sex trafficking. Praise God for you. My issue is, is fighting poverty. Praise God for you. But listen, um, while many issues are important, they don't all carry the same moral weight. So I'm not here to denigrate any other cause or justice issue that you're involved in. If, you, if you're involved in other justice issues, praise God for you. Keep doing that. I believe God puts callings on people's lives for, for specific things. And in fact, I, you know, I would join you outside of brothels to try to rescue women from trafficking yeah. and get them help. I'm not saying that you need to abandon other issues to fully fight abortion. What I'm saying is that everyone has a role to play in fighting abortion even more so than other issues. And here's why. Because abortion is not just one issue among many. Another way to say that, Mark, yeah. is that the right to life is not just one right among many. The right to life is the prerequisite right, without which no other rights can be realized. If you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. And you watch this play out in real time, brothers and sisters, in 2020. Democratic high priests telling you you didn't have the liberty to worship, to gather together, to hug your grandma. Oh, they look away. They, they, they tried to take away our natural right to liberty. Um, business owners who had their property burned down to the ground by the high priests of BLM who said America is systemically evil and so you have to burn it all to the ground. Where were their property rights? How many BLM rioters were arrested and charged with destruction of property? Very little, if any. Mm. So I guess the Democratic governors and mayors of our cities and states ignored and refused to protect Americans' natural rights to liberty and property. Well, what's the first right that our Constitution was designed to protect? Mm -hmm. The right to life. 
And so the reason why they don't take protecting your natural right to liberty and property, right, brothers and sisters, is because they've denied and ignored and spat upon the first and most important of all rights, life, without which no other rights can be realized. So that's why abortion is not just one issue among many. It's actually the most important issue. And Ronald Reagan recognized this as did Abraham Lincoln. And Ronald Reagan, in his book, Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation, which, by the way, Reagan was formerly pro-choice. He actually That's had right, some pro-choice yes. legislation. So he, he actually had some blood on his hands. Mm -hmm. He had a conversion to pro-life. And he wrote in his book, Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation, he said this. He said, Abraham Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free country as long as some men could decide that others are not fit to be free and should therefore be slaves. And then Reagan said, likewise, today, we cannot survive as a free land when some men can decide that others are not fit to live and should therefore be abandoned to abortion or infanticide. There is no cause more important than affirming the transcendent right to life of all human beings, the right without which no other rights have any meaning. So Reagan and Lincoln understood that, that slavery and abortion both functioned as litmus tests of the republic because it strike to the very heart of who we were as a people. Do we believe in natural rights and the inalienable right to life that comes from our creator? So I just wanna say that to you Christians, brothers and sisters, please continue participating in other justice causes if you are. But if you've ever wondered how you would live in 1940s Germany or in 1850s America, if you've ever wondered, would I be an abolitionist with Frederick Douglass? <laughs> would right. I be part of the confessing church with Dietrich Bonhoeffer right. and Martin Niemöller and, and Oscar Schindler who rescued yes. 1,200 Jews? Would I have been one of those men or women? It, these are hard words, please listen to me. I can give you the answer to that question. What kind of man or woman you would have been in Germany or slavery America or antebellum South? Here's the answer. It's what you're doing on abortion today. Whatever you do on the issue of abortion right now in 2021 in America is the same type of actions you would have taken in 1940s Germany or in 1850s America. And that's for one simple reason, the power of normalization. Culture is to us, Mark, what water is to a fish. It's what we swim in, it's all we know. Right. And unfortunately, Christians for far too long have been more impacted by culture and the liturgy of the religion of secular progressivism, then we have been impacted by the biblical liturgy, by the Christian liturgy, by the scriptures and by Christ himself. This is what is called syncretism. Syncretism yeah. is when, you, when mm -hmm. you merge or mesh pagan ideologies onto Christianity, but you still call it Christianity. Mm -hmm. And this is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer called themselves the confessing church, meaning we're confessing real Christianity. And the yeah. rest of you Germans who are condoning the Holocaust or doing nothing against it, you have what Bonhoeffer called a cheap grace, not real Christianity, syncretism. So we've been more impacted by the culture on the issue of abortion than we have been impacted by the scriptures. And so that's why many Christians will say, I'm personally pro-life. Like I would never get an abortion, Mark, but I don't think we should make it illegal. This is why you'll hear woke Christians say, I'm pro-life, but I'm voting for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because I read somewhere that democratic policies decrease abortions. And so we should vote for the party of abortion whose platform says abortion through point of birth and funded with the public dole because that's what real pro-lifers do. Wait, whoa, what? Real pro-lifers wouldn't do that. Christians who love the prenatal deity who entered human history in Mary's womb would not do that. And so we, we are also syncretizing our face with pagan ideologies. And losing our influence. That's right, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because Francis Schaeffer once said that if the, if the church can't speak out against something as evil as killing a baby, then the world has the right to ask whether Christ is real. If the church has nothing to say on the genocide of baby image bearers, Mark, and the location that our savior entered human history in and from which we once came, then the church has nothing to say on anything. The right to life becomes the litmus test. Abortion becomes the litmus test of the Republic. And Martin Luther once said this beautifully, by the way. Martin Luther talked to this, this issue, this issue of if you can't stand on the most fundamental issues, then nothing else matters. Martin Luther once said that if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition, every portion of the truth of God, praise God, except hmm, precisely that point at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be steady on every battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. 
and we've got a lot of flinching happening in American pulpits today, who wax and wane beautiful theology on every other issue, but when it comes to the genocide of one million baby image bearers who Christ is literally knitting together in the womb, they cave like, they fold like a cheap suit and have nothing to say to that issue, fulfilling Francis Schaeffer's prophetic line. So what do I say to you, Christian? I say, thank God for your leadership. Thank God for your pastor. Thank God for this moment where the line of the tribe of Judah is on the move again, waking up mm. the church. And now this is a test. This will either be our finest hour or it may be our last hour, our last hour in terms of freedom, our last mm. hour to freely preach the gospel. Because a politics and a religion that denies the right to life to human beings will have no problem trampling on, crapping on, yeah. <laughs> ignoring every other right that we have, including religious liberty, including property rights, including every other right that we kind of take for granted in America. So it's time for us to wake up and begin being as, as passionate and focused on restoring the right to life to the unborn as we are selfishly to protecting our own rights, our right to liberty and property. It's easy to care more about our own rights because we're selfish yeah, individuals. Right. Well, what about those who, who don't even have the most fundamental right and they don't have the ability or power to secure it? the unborn. We have to secure it for them. So for too long, the church has been like the Levite and the priest in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Levite and the priest were religious leaders. Remember, Mark? Yeah. They were pastors. They were probably on their way to the synagogue to prep their message. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a bleeding guy and he was in a ditch and he was half dead and he needed your help. They walked by on the other side of the road. For too long, we have been like the Levite and the priest who maybe we were anti-street mugging. <laughs> maybe we were anti-abortion. But then we drive by the very centers that we have the addresses to where innocent human beings are scheduled to die or rip limb from limb and their mothers are treated as prospects for abortion. And we say we're too busy, we're heading to church and we're heading to work and we allow it in our cities. It was the Good Samaritan, the bleeding victim's natural enemy because Jews and Samaritans hated one yeah. another, who when he saw the bleeding victim, he adopted personal responsibility and sacrifices to love a neighbor that was almost dead. He bandaged a man's wounds. He poured on oil and wine. He put him on his own donkey so he had to walk. He took him to the nearest inn. He started nursing him back to health. Then he told the innkeeper, I have to go now, but when I come back, I'm going to pay you for any other costs that accumulated in caring for this bleeding victim while I was gone. So brothers and sisters, the good Samaritan made radical sacrifices of his time, his energy, and his money to love a bleeding victim doomed to die. But unlike the good Samaritan today, Mark, we know when and where these innocent human beings are targeted. The Good Samaritan just happened to come upon an innocent human being who had been abused and was half dead. He didn't know when and where that was going to happen. If he did, he probably would have tried to prevent it before it happened. Right. We have the addresses, Mark. We know when and where these innocent human beings are scheduled to die. There's only one place in America today where we can say this. We know on this day, at this time, innocent human beings are scheduled to die. Where's the church? Well, Praise God for Charlotte. Praise God for the pastors and the leaders here. Charlotte is the most active sidewalk counseling city in the country mm -hmm. because the church is waking up and saying, no longer on my watch. In America, we are the sovereign. So to quote Spider-Man's uncle, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Or to quote Jesus of Nazareth, to whom much is given, much is required. Much is required of us because we are the sovereign in America. Our political leaders serve at our pleasure and we can vote them out if we want. So we have to do what the Israelites did when they were in exile, which is to obey Christ's command to seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, because in her welfare, you will find your welfare. We need to be salt and light, get uncomfortable, and start and, and resolve to end the genocide of abortion, because if the church can't do it, no one else will. So that would be my call to the church, and guess what? It's gonna be an exciting journey because Jesus is already outside of these death camps. Yeah. And when we show up, he does miracles because mm. he's waiting for his bride to show up so he can slip his hand into us like puppets and use us as his bride in this, on this mm. fallen earth until he comes back. Seth, you've got to come back because people need to understand the seriousness of the times that we're living in Amen. right now. Uh, I personally believe that maybe we're at since 1973, maybe at the closest point ever, first of all, of overturning Roe versus Wade. Right. Um, but it's going to take the church. That's right. Uh, not being silent anymore. I, I, I right. tell people, I'm not a woke pastor, but I am awake. <laughs> Amen. <Okay. laughs> uh, and uh, the church has got to be awakened to this. Praise Thank God. you for being with us. Praise God. Man. We're going to put Seth's information up.
so that you can have more contact with Seth and listen to his podcast and understand exactly what is going on uh, around the world. And we want you to go ahead and share this because this information has got to be listened to, played, uh, uh, promoted, shared over and over and over again because we are at a moment in time in history that if we're going to stay free, we have to do something right now. That's right. I want to thank you for being with us today, Seth. Awesome. Absolutely. Really. Let me give three quick last yes. things. Go to um, my, my podcast and subscribe. It's called Unaborted with Seth Gruber. I do two episodes a week. If you guys listen to it for a few months, you will become a pro-life ninja. You yeah. will become an ambassador and a confident one for the unborn. Also, listen to my message from Calvary Chapel Chattanooga. Um, two weeks ago, called The Religion, Sacrament, and Liturgy of Planned Parenthood. And I go into all and more of what I just did. Share that with people so they yeah. understand the spiritual battlefield yeah. we're facing. And, and secondly, thirdly, if you're a part of a faith-based high school, another youth group, another church, and you, you say, we need this at our church. I'm just kerosene. What I do is I just pour kerosene everywhere, and I, right, light, yeah. I drop a match, and I take off. Now you got to do yeah, something about right, the yeah. fire. I want to put a fire in people's souls to end abortion. So I have a church partner that partners with me because they care so much about getting my message to young people in churches. And it's specifically reserved for churches and youth groups who don't have the funds or financial ability to fly me out if they're in a different state, right. to put me in a hotel, to pay me a small honorarium, all those expenses. I have a church partner that's partnered with me. So if you're a church, a youth group, anything like that, and you're like, uh, we'd love to have Seth, but we can't, we can't afford that. Done. Covered. No excuses. Yeah. But don't take advantage of it if you do have the funds. But that's, that's specifically in order to wake up more young people and more people in the, in the church. So thank you, Mark, for the role that you're playing in that. And uh, I look forward to working together. Well, thank you, Seth. And thank you, really. Uh, share this, folks, for being with us today on Midweek Talks. And we will see you again next time.